Yeah, we can't leave that. We just need to push something else. Pardon? Okay. Yeah. I was going to say these Go ahead, yeah. Yes. We've been doing that for four years now. I, it's, it hurts here, and it hurts here, but it'll hurt less when you never make that mistake for the rest of your life. So whatever. I don't know. It hurts all the time. It hurts constantly. Okay, let's try this out. Um, I just want to go over disproportionation reactions. I just that's I just want to cover it like really really quickly, um, and then we're not really gonna talk about rusting and sacrificial metals. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we will. All right. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Just pick one. I know. Disproportionation uh, disproportionation refers to a substance oxidizing itself. It's also called auto oxidation. Now that's not a term that you're going to see, but you will see disproportionation. So what's happening here is when you look at your data booklet, Let's try and take a look at our data booklet on page 7 for all of the redox equations, the half reactions. Let's try and find iron 2 plus. I want to know, can iron 2 plus act as an oxidizing agent? And can iron 2 plus act as a reducing agent? I want to know, is that possible? So I want you to try and find iron 2 plus on the oxidizing agent side and find iron 2 plus on the reducing agent side, please, for me. Go ahead. Look for it. Iron 2 plus and iron 2 plus. Are they on both sides? Is it on both sides? Yep. Yep. So I see iron 2 plus. It's, pr it's a pretty weak oxidizing agent, but it's still an oxidizing agent. It's way down, kind of close to the bottom. It's only about a third of the way up. And then I see iron 2 plus as well as a reducing agent, and it's just a little bit stronger, just barely stronger than silver is as a metal. Now that makes it a pretty weak reducing agent as well, but it could act as a reducing agent. What I want to know is if iron 2 plus can act as an oxidizing agent and it can act as a reducing agent. Here it is acting as an oxidizing agent, and here it is acting as a reducing agent. What I want to know is let's, let's try and balance this reaction. So I've, I've, we've already got our two half reactions here. What's the lowest common multiple of electrons being transferred? I mean, two and one, what's going to happen? We need 2, so we're going to multiply the first reaction by 2. So let's try and add all of this up. I get an iron 2 plus plus 2 electrons 
plus, whoa, that's weird, two more iron two pluses. So how would I write that? Is it okay that we write it as three iron two pluses all on the left hand side? I've got an iron two plus as a reactant here and two of them again as another reactant. So I've got three iron two pluses. And it's turning into iron solid and two iron three plus ions. Hopefully you recognize the two electrons and the two times one electrons, they will cancel each other out. So this is what a disproportionation looks like. Disproportionation is something basically reacting with itself and it's saying, okay, uh, we've all got a certain number of electrons, how about I give you some electrons and so we're going to turn into different things. One of these loses two electrons to turn into iron solid, and it passes one electron each to its partners, and they turn into iron three plus. I would like you to tell me, is this reaction going to be spontaneous? Does iron two plus spontaneously auto-oxidize itself? No. You're going to see iron 2 plus as an oxidizing agent way above iron 2 plus as a reducing, reducing agent. So this is going to be non-spontaneous. This is still a unique style of reaction. What I want to ask you, does non-spontaneous mean that this will never happen? No, it doesn't mean that it will never happen. It just means we have to do something very special to it in order to force it to happen. And we'll talk about that more in chapter 14, when we're done with chapter 13. Okay, so that's auto-oxidization. I want to talk just a little bit about um, uh, rusting and sacrificial metals. And this will go back to predicting, this will go back to predicting redox reactions. As soon as we're done this, I'm going to get you to do some predicting, predicting redox reactions practice, because I know over the weekends your brain's melted a little bit, and that's fine. OK, iron metal and water. Let's try this. I want you to find iron metal and water on your data booklet. Where is iron metal and where is water? There's only one spot you can find iron metal, right? It's as a reducing agent, kind of like uh, two-thirds of the way down. So where is water on the other side? Is water a, like a pretty strong oxidizing agent, or is it a pretty weak oxidizing agent? It's, I think it's pretty weak. When I look at this, Iron and water, do they make a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous reaction? Iron and water, they make non-spontaneous, right? So iron and water make a non-spontaneous reaction. Oh, that's weird. What, uh, what normally happens when you put iron in water? Do you know? It rusts. When you have a car sitting outside, and when it's exposed to the elements, it will rust, right? Iron will rust. Well, how is that possible when this makes a non-spontaneous reaction? Do we need any other ingredients? You need oxygen. Oxygen is a huge uh, kind of difference maker. Let's look. Where is water as an oxidizing agent? It's like uh, two-thirds of the way down. That's pretty darn weak. Now what I want you to do is I want you to look for water and oxygen together as an oxidizing agent. Is it significantly higher up on the list? Way higher. It's way up here. Now, as soon as you add a little bit of oxygen into the mix, 
do oxygen and water, are they a strong enough oxidizing agent to be able to corrode iron metal? That is a spontaneous reaction, for sure. So when you add oxygen to the water, the reaction becomes spontaneous. And the iron metal, right, the iron atoms turn into iron ions. The iron ions are now free to combine with oxygen to form iron oxide, eventually commonly known as rust. So let's try that. Let's try and predict this reaction. Let's say in our reaction we've got iron, we've got water, and we have oxygen. What I want us to do is I want us to list the major entities, and I want us to predict the reaction that we will get when we get these things combining together. So what are the major entities? What does iron look like? Fe with no charge solid, right? If it's elemental, if it's an element in its pure form, it's not going to be an ion. Water, what does water look like? H2O. H2O. And oxygen, what does oxygen look like? O2 gas. So I want you to try and find your strongest reducing agent and your strongest oxidizing agent in the list. We already have, but I just want you to do it again and just label them. Nicola was so hesitant to even open up his data booklet. Didn't even want to do it. What's our strongest oxidizing agent here? Oxygen and water. And our strongest reducing agent is iron. So let's write out our two half reactions that we're going to get from this. So that. There we go. Oh, hey. So I'm going to write out that iron is going to turn into iron 2 plus. It's two electrons. Is this my oxidation or reduction half reaction? Oh, uh, this this is an oxidation half reaction, right? But the oxidation half reaction involves the reducing agent, okay? And then we're going to write our other reaction, and I don't have that one memorized, not even close. O2 plus 2 plus 4. Plus 4 electrons turns into four hydroxide ions. So now that we have an oxidation half reaction and a reduction half reaction, now we can combine them together. Can I just add these things together? No, what do I have to do first? I have to kind of identify the lowest common multiple. And between two and four, what's that? Four moles of electrons. So I'm going to multiply this by two. So we'll get two iron atoms reacting with oxygen gas plus two waters. going to produce two iron two plus ions and four hydroxide ions. So really what this process does is it makes iron two hydroxide, but iron two hydroxide is like the first step on its way of to forming a rust. That's iron oxide. Once this kind of all dries up, it would end up uh, making uh, rust. So hopefully we're okay with that. 
Do you need oxygen in order to oxidize iron? Do you need oxygen present in order to make iron rust? Yeah, you do, totally. Now, there's lots of things that we can do to prevent that. Um, you're, I mean, in the elements, we're almost always going to have water, and we're almost always going to have oxygen present. That's, that's like always going to happen, so that's, there's not, not much we can do about doing that. But there's a lot of ways that we can prevent the rusting of iron or prevent the corroding of a metal. Probably the most common way of preventing the corrosion of a metal is just coating it with a layer of what? Paint. Just paint your metal. Why? Why does that prevent the oxidation of a metal? What? It's because these particles can't collide with each other and, tr and transfer electrons, right? And so here, if we have our iron ion or iron atoms, so I've got a layer of iron atoms, and if I paint it, then the water and the oxygen can't get at it. So you're, you're just preventing the two chemicals from really colliding with each other. There's, there's no electron transfer here. That's not the only thing that I could do. Instead of coating it with a layer of paint, I could coat it with a layer of something else. Metal. metal. What kind of metal? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at this. Iron is way down here. Oxygen and water is way up here. Are there any metals? Are there any metals out there that wouldn't react with oxygen and water? For example, would silver react with oxygen and water? No. So you could coat it in a layer of silver. What else could you coat it in? You could coat it in gold. <laughs> right? Those are really the only two options. You could coat it in like a layer of mercury too, but that's pretty insane as well. <laughs> so you could coat it in a layer of paint or a less reactive <laughs> metal, like silver or gold. Now, what's the big problem with this? It's expensive. <laughs> Do you want to coat, let's say you want to put an iron roof on your, or let's say you, uh, let's say you want to protect the iron that's in the steel in your car, right? So, okay, you want to protect your car from corroding, so you're just going to cover the whole friggin' car in gold? Is that what you're going to do? Okay, as, as wicked as that would be, cry, yeah, and, that's, and that's, the, that's really the big problem with it. It's like, oh, that would look awesome, but at the same time, all of the parts that you can't see of your car would be coated in gold, and so there's not really any point with that, right? Uh, yeah, San Jam. Wouldn't that like make it really heavy too? Mm. If you just cover it, like yes, it would totally add to the weight of your car. Okay. Um, but if you just covered it in a thin sheet of gold, you would prevent the iron from reacting with water and oxygen, and it wouldn't add a ton of weight. I agree it would add weight. Yes, 100%. Jordy. Um, so how does galvanizing work? It is a sacrificial anode. Okay, so let's think. Another thing you could do, and as as insane as this sounds, in, <laughs> instead of covering it with a less reactive metal, you could cover it So let's, let's think about this. What? A sacrificial anode, and you don't even know what an anode is, and that's totally fine. But a sacrificial anode is 
you have a stronger reducing agent than iron present. So what I want you to think about, Jordy, Jordy, do you know what, somebody just said it, but do you know what galvanizing, the process of galvanizing is? You cover iron, you just cover it in a layer of, does anybody know what metal? Zinc. You cover it in zinc. So let's, let's, let's think about this. You've got your iron nail. That's a terrible nail. Don't calm down. That it's okay. And we cover it in a protective layer of zinc. Now, when you take your nail and when you strike it with a hammer, do you think you might break that protective layer a little bit every once in a while? Yeah. Yes, okay. So you have iron, you have zinc, and you have oxygen, and you have water. All of these things are kind of mixed together. They're all kind of touching each other. So what's, what's going to react with what here? What do you think is going to react first? The oxygen and the water, do you agree that this yeah. is still our strongest oxidizing agent? Mm -hmm. But now, between zinc and iron, which one is the stronger reducing agent? Mm -hmm. Iron's up here, but zinc's down here. So the zinc will react way before the iron does. So instead of getting the iron to react, the zinc will react. And then once the zinc is all completely reacted, then the iron will start to react. So what you're doing is you're giving yourself a buffer zone of a certain amount of time before all of the zinc totally reacts. And that's only, that's only if the zinc uh, layer gets uh, kind of punctured somehow. If the zinc completely surrounds your iron, your iron will be good for the rest of time. But as soon as the zinc starts to peel away a little bit or it starts to get scratched off, then you're, it's like kind of like a ticking time bomb. Then your iron will eventually corrode. So this is what we call a sacrificial anode. And this happens all the time. This is used everywhere in the world. This is the last thing we're going to talk about. Then I'll get you to do some uh, practice. <laughs> Old boats. Old ships used to be covered in copper because it was super easy to anneal it uh, onto the hull of a ship. It was really easy to, to, would you agree copper sheets are pretty easy to form into specific shapes? Yeah, that's what the Statue of Liberty is made out of, right? Boss is shaking his head, no. The copper covering on the hull of a ship, which is the main body of the ship that is in contact with the water, it corrodes when it's exposed to oxygen and water. Do you agree? that oxygen and water can corrode copper. Yes, that will make a spontaneous reaction. What we can do, we don't even have to cover the copper in a metal. All we have to do to protect against such corrosion, uh, Sir Humphrey Davy, who was like a, an old school chemist, like way back in the day, really, really, really famous. What he did <clears throat> was he used blocks of zinc, tin, or iron. Why did he choose zinc, tin, or iron? Where's copper? Where's zinc, tin, and iron? All the way down here. They're all more reactive than the copper is. So what happens? What happens here is uh, oh yeah, there's these sacrificial anodes, and when they're in the water. Basically what happens is, okay, let's say, let's say the copper solid did react and it got rid of some electrons, so it turned into copper 2 plus. All of a sudden, you've got copper 2 plus in contact. All of a sudden, you've got copper 2 plus in contact with your zinc. What can copper 2 plus do to that zinc? What can copper 2 plus do to the zinc? It can react with it, and the copper 2 plus can steal the zinc's electrons. 
And when the copper 2 plus steals the electrons away from the zinc, what does it turn back into? Just regular copper solid. So what you're doing is you're sacrificing this chunk of zinc. It doesn't have to cover the thing, it just has to be there. And all you need is for the electrons to be transferable from the zinc to the copper. That's all you need. The moment that copper turns into copper 2 plus, then it will react with the zinc and then the zinc will, will sacrifice its electrons to keep the copper as a metal. Jordy. Okay, well why didn't they just like, make the bottle of aluminum? Because you need a band to hand it up and um, What do you think is this? These boats are like super old school, old timey, 1800s, 1700s. Yeah. And so what I want to ask you is which metal was discovered first, copper or aluminum? Copper was. Copper is, copper is one of the coinage metals. It's been used for thousands and thousands of years. Also, you probably don't know this, but which metal is easier to purify? Copper, by far. Copper is way easier. It's way easier to turn copper oxide into copper than it is to turn aluminum oxide into aluminum. And so copper was just more prevalent, it was cheaper, and it was easier to work with. So they, now what, what would you use? Aluminum. Yeah, you would use aluminum all day, right? Or if it's a really cheap boat, you would use steel, right? Okay, so I just, want you to, I just want you to answer this question. In order to prevent corrosion, prevent corrosion, a sacrificial anode is connected to an underground propane tank made of iron metal. Right, we've got a tank made of iron. Which one of these could act as a sacrificial anode? Cannot. 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 Oh, which one of these cannot? Ooh, sorry, that's totally different. Whoa. Which one of these could not act as a sacrificial no, anode? <laughs> could, could copper sacrifice its electron, uh, electrons to the iron? And remember, this is the idea. When iron, when iron turns into iron 2 plus ions, we want something else that's lower than it to be able to sacrifice, right? Copper is way above it, right? So can copper sacrifice electrons for the iron 2 plus? No. This is the only one that cannot act as a sacrificial anode. OK, so. I would like you to, uh, sorry it's not up on the board, but there's six practice problems uh, predicting redox reactions. I would like you to do those for me, please. Um, uh, should it be for marks? No. No. Yeah. no. She said it's just practice. Exactly. No. 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 I will leave. Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I, I'm thinking three of these six questions. I don't like the ones. So three of these six. Any three of these six questions. You have to see the ones you want. Yeah, you got to tell me which ones you want me to mark. And if and if uh, if you don't tell me, I'm gonna pick your worst three. I'm just kidding. I'm gonna pick the first three. Yeah, the first three. What if we do all six?